Well, what's going on, Wake? How you guys doing tonight? We're doing good? Hey, how many of you guys have had finals already or are having more finals this week? Anyone raise, raise your hand? Okay, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Now, look at you guys with your priorities in order in the house of God during finals week. No, keep them up. All right, single people in here, these are the groups of people that you need to pick your future spouse from, okay? Because they've got their priorities in order in the house of God during finals week. Hey, if we've not met before, my name is Nick. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Copper Point. And anytime I get the opportunity to come and share with you guys uh, here at Wake, I'm excited. You know, Wake is where I got my start speaking 10 years ago. And so anytime I come to Wake, it feels like I'm coming home. And I love it. I love you guys. And I love this movement of people and what you guys are doing on the campus of UNM. And I'm just excited to see what happens in the future with you guys. And so we're in the, the sixth week of the sermon series in the book of Ephesians. And uh, tonight we're going to be camping out in chapter, or chapter 5. But you've heard from Pastor Brandon. You've heard from Delaney. You've heard from Dustin. And last week we got to hear from Luke. Is he in here right now? Oh, he's back here. Let's give it up for Luke one time. Hey, I heard that you did an incredible job, man. And Luke is that guy. He's good at everything. He's up here singing songs and leading worship, and then he can preach the house down, and he's athletic, and he's a, an electrician, too. What, what else do you do? You're making us all look bad, Luke. Thanks a lot. But hey, so we're going to continue with this sermon series in the book of Ephesians. And Ephesians is literally my favorite book in the Bible. And uh, it's only six chapters in length, and that's not why it's my favorite, but it, it helps. It's six chapters. But in those six chapters of the book of Ephesians, there's so much information. There's so many things that we can pull for our lives and from that book. And I love the way Paul, who wrote the book of Ephesians, kind of broke it down and structured it. When you look at the first three chapters of Ephesians, right, we've got really doctrinal things, really deep things, like Christ's exaltation above all, like God, the Trinity, and his saving grace, like really big, deep theological concepts. And then you move on into chapters four through six, and we get to more of the practical matters and how we live those things out. And theologians refer to this as the doctrinal indicatives. They call those doctrinal indicatives. Basically what they're saying uh, is that uh, Paul is challenging us to become who God's called us to be in the second half of Ephesians based off of who God is in the first half of Ephesians. Does that make sense? You following me? In the first three chapters, we learn about how good God is, how great he is, how much he loves us, how much grace he has. And in the second half of the book of Ephesians, over here in the last three chapters, what do we do about it? It's like a cause and effect kind of thing. And that's why I love this book. It breaks it down practically in the latter parts of the book to help us know how to live our life. And like I said, today we're going to be camping out in chapter 5. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to get started right here uh, with verse 1. Say hey when you're there. Oh, you guys are good. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to read Ephesians 5 to you. Oh, th thank you. Thank you. That would be me. I'm like, where's Ephesians? It's, it's after this. Um, okay, Ephesians 5. And I love, now I, want you, I want you to feel the gravity of what Paul's saying here. I'm, I'm serious. Put yourself in this. This is deep. This is powerful stuff. Paul says the very, the very opening of the book, he says, Therefore, be imitators of God. That's big. That's heavy. As, be, as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us. He says, and walk in what? What does he say to walk in? He says to walk in what? As Christ loved us. As Christ loved us. That's powerful. That's big. That's deep. And that's a call. You know, that's, that's a high, high, high call. And if you get anything that I say today, uh, that's what I want you to get. You know, we're not necessarily talking about that, but I don't think that we could look past a passage of Scripture that powerful and profound without stopping down for a second and acknowledging those words. We're called to walk in love. No matter what's happening in our lives, no matter what we're dealing with, no matter what we're facing, no matter what struggles or trials are ahead of us, we're called to walk in what? Love. In every situation, in every circumstance, no matter what's going on, we're called to walk in what? Love. So I want you to get that. I want you to hold on to that. I want you to store that in here and store that in here. And then we'll continue on reading in chapter 5. So it, it continues in verse 2. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. 
let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking. Some people are like, ooh, crude joking, that's, that's big. Crude joking, uh, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. I love that. It's powerful. It's deep. And it talks about, Paul's talking about behaviors here. But who he's talking to is a very specific audience. Paul, in this passage of scripture, is addressing the church in Ephesus. He's talking to believers. And up till verse 6, Paul is talking about things that as believers we need to stay clear of. Behaviors that we need to avoid in our own lives in order to walk in love, in order to walk in the truth of who Jesus is. And so you see him, though, what's awesome is that in verse 6, we, we get to a, a little verse in Scripture that is so easy to look past. And I know I've read this several times, and so many times I've looked past verse 6, but it's so profound. He says, after all that, Paul says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Let no one deceive you with empty words. And that's so easy, again, to look past. But when you really understand the context of what's happening at this time, uh, in Ephesus, it all makes sense. At this time, uh, in Ephesus, there were groups of people, um, some that were, you know, um, outside of the church and even some that were in the church that were spreading misinformation, that were spreading false teaching, that were spreading empty words. Specifically, there was a group called the Gnostics, and this group of people were basically teaching that we could do anything we want with our physical body as long as we're okay with God because our spirit and our physical body are completely separate. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what you subject yourself to. As long as you proclaim to be a Jesus follower, then you're good to go. And so Paul is speaking to this pe these people, and he's saying, watch out for those empty words. Watch out for those empty words. And if you're taking notes tonight, the title of this message is The Fog of Empty Words. The Fog of Empty Words. Today we're going to be talking about empty words and what Paul meant in verse 6 of Ephesians 5. And we're going to be answering three questions. And those questions that we're going to be answering are, what are empty words? What do they cause? And how do you navigate them? What are empty words? What do they cause? And how do you navigate them? You know, my favorite place in all of the world is England, is the UK. Anybody in here love the UK? We got a couple people. Guys, I'm obsessed. I even named my daughter Britain. I've got a daughter I named her Britain. I've been there several times. I love the United Kingdom. I love the UK. You know, I've even been guilty of faking an accent here and there. Uh, <laughs> sorry. And it's got me in trouble a couple times, actually. There was one time I was, uh, true story, I was at the Denver airport. And I'm late to my gate. I'm trying to get home. And I'm moving down those, what would you call them, those fast walkways? When you walk fast along the walkway? And I'm passing people. And as I'm passing, you like my walk? Uh, as I'm passing people, um, I'm saying in my British accent, cheers. Cheers. If you guys, I know it sounds random, but if you've been to the UK, you know that cheers is, is a substitute for everything. They'll say cheers for thank you. They'll say cheers for, you know, you're welcome. They'll say cheers for everything. So I'm passing by people, and I'm saying cheers as they're moving out of the way. I get down towards the end of this walkway. It's about to end. There's a one more guy at the end that I have to pass. And as I'm passing him, I say cheers in my British accent. And he turns and looks at me as we get off together. And he says, where about you from, mate? And I just ran really fast. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do. I was a poser, and I got caught. I got caught in that moment. That's a true story. I got caught in that moment. And <laughs> to this day, it's kind of made me check that. But I have that tendency sometimes to talk in a British accent. And it's so bad, too. But I try. I try. You know, the, the UK is known for a lot of things, right? It's known for great soccer. We've got a Man City jersey over here. Go City. we can known for great soccer. It's known for bad food. People know, know the UK for bad food. Uh, but it's also known for something uh, more than food and soccer. It's known for fog. The UK is known for fog. It's, it's such a common association with the UK that they even have a drink at most coffee shops around the world called a London, a London fog. It's a common associ association. And if you know anything about fog, what you know is that fog is dense. It's dense. 
it can disorient you, it can confuse you, and you can truly get lost in it sometimes. And I think in a lot of ways, fog in the physical sense is a good example of the empty words that we have to navigate in our lives each and every day. You know, and in order for us to navigate these empty words, we got to take a minute and kind of discuss what are empty words. You know, Paul in Ephesians 5, 6 uses the phrase empty words. The original Greek, he uses a specific word intentionally. And the word that Paul uses is a word called kinos or kinos. It's actually pronounced kinos. Uh, kinos. And what kinos means is anything that's void of truth or without the fruits of faith. Anything that's void of truth or without the fruits of faith. See, Paul is saying that if the words we're hearing aren't grounded in the word of God, then they're void of truth. That's what he's saying. He's saying in Ephesians 6, be careful of empty words. Be careful of words that aren't grounded in the word of God. Be careful of what you're listening to and what you're allowing into your mind and what you're allowing into your heart. You've got to be careful and you've got to stay guarded. And that's what Paul is speaking to here. Be aware and be careful of those empty words. Empty words are everywhere today. They're everywhere. You know, we see them or we hear them in the media. We hear them in lecture halls. Sometimes we hear them from our friends and our family. Sometimes they're actually intended to hurt us. Sometimes empty words are given to us with the best of intentions. And sometimes they're wrapped up in this pretty little religious bow, and it's really hard to decipher the truth from empty words. You know, some people today will tell you that it's okay to believe some parts of the Bible, but not all parts of the Bible. You know, I think, before we go any further, even more dangerous than somebody telling you that you can't believe anything the Bible says is somebody telling you that you can't believe everything the Bible says. And that happens a lot today. People are saying constantly that we can't believe, yeah, we can't believe, you can, you can clap for that. We can't believe what the Bible says, everything it says. See, because that leads, that leads us to picking and choosing our own Bible and picking and choosing our own Jesus. And see, Paul realized that, and that's why he wrote this to the church of Ephesus. But even more than that, he realized it. So not only did he write the church of Ephesus, but he also wrote his protege, Timothy, who was one of the leaders, one of the main leaders of the church of Ephesus. And this is what he tells Timothy. Um, he says, Timothy, uh, I, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. So he's basically telling, telling Timothy, hey, hey, look out. There's some people out there saying some pretty attractive things. There, there are some people out there spreading some pretty appealing mistruths that are going to derail a bunch of people. Timothy, stay guarded. Look out. That fog, the fog of empty words is thick, and you need to know what it looks like so that you can navigate it and navigate it for the people that you're leading. And I, and I look at that, I'm like, what a word for us today. You know, maybe, maybe when you're thinking about um, empty words and the doctrinal things that we face all the time, people are always saying things about the Word of God being totality of truth, being truth in, 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 in fullness. And that's something that we've got to be aware of and combat um, in, in our hearts and in our minds. But maybe in your life right now, the empty words that you're hearing aren't necessarily doctrinal. Maybe the empty words that you're hearing and allowing into your heart and in, into your heart and into your mind are personal. Maybe your empty words that you're allowing into your life are about who people have said you are. Maybe people have said that you're a failure. Maybe have people have said to you that you would never amount to anything or you'll never change or you'll always be that guy or you'll always be that girl. But what I want you to know is that it doesn't matter what people say about you and it doesn't matter who people say you are. It doesn't even matter who you say you are. What matters is who God says you are, and who God says you are is an overcomer. He says you're more than a conqueror. He says you're trusted, you're loved, you're forgiven, you're set free. That's who God says you are. So anytime anybody wants to say something contradictory to what the Word of God says about you, those are empty words. Don't let them in here, and don't let them in there. Be guarded. Be guarded. Another example of empty words, personal empty words that you might be experiencing and I think I've heard this several times in my life, is somebody telling you or telling me, just do what feels right. Just do what feels right. Don't worry about the consequences. Don't, 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 don't think about tomorrow. Just, just do what feels good. YOLO. Do you guys say YOLO anymore? Okay, I'm sorry, guys. I'm in my 30s now. I'm so out of touch. I tried. It's, uh, but, but, but seriously, you get to those points, no, we don't say YOLO. Who says YOLO? 
This is so two years ago. Um, but seriously, though, you have those times and those people that, that will tell you that. Just do what feels right. And although that sounds really good, it's extremely misleading. It's extremely misleading. You know, I'm not saying that we need to sit here and worry about everything or worry about the future. In fact, the Bible says not to worry about the future. But we need to keep the future in mind when in our decision making. When we're making our decisions, we have to be future-minded. you got to remember that what we do today is a setup for our tomorrow. We've heard that, right? we got to believe that, and we got to practice that. You know, I had a, a conversation with a guy, man, a few months ago, actually, who was interested in joining our internship, and um, he told me in a conversation that he felt called to ministry. And I thought, that's cool. You know, I've had this conversation several times. That's awesome. And specifically, he told me that he felt called to speak. Okay, that's cool. Uh, and as we started navigating this conversation, he went on to say, and here's a disclaimer, this guy was awesome, he's an awesome guy, if you're in here, you're awesome. Um, but he went on to say, um, he went on to say, I feel called to speak, but I don't really feel called to serve. I don't really want to do a whole lot of that serving stuff. I feel like I have a gift, I feel like I have a gift and I need to practice this gift more, and so I don't think I'm the guy that's going to be doing a lot of the chairs and setting up the chairs, or a guy that's going to be doing a lot of, you know, gathering people. I want to do the speaking. And he goes, I, what made it worse is he, he like validated that statement by saying, you know, I was talking to some friends recently. Whoa, empty words. I was talking to some friends recently, and they told me that I'm good enough to speak, and I probably shouldn't spend that time serving. And I thought to myself, I'm like, wow, you've got really dumb friends. But I didn't say that. What I did say to him, though, is I said to him, I said, if you feel, if you feel overqualified to serve, then you're underqualified to speak. And I said, oh, yeah, I did tell him that. And then I said, all, you know, all he had to do was open the Bible to any, any part of the Bible and see how Jesus led and how Jesus served the people he led. And he wouldn't even went down that road and listened to those empty words that his friends told him. And so he didn't realize that serving today would build a platform for him to speak off of tomorrow. And that's something that we lose sight of today because the world teaches us that what we do today matters because there is no tomorrow, right? But what Jesus teaches us is that today matters because of tomorrow. What we do today matters because of tomorrow, not just in your personal life, not just in your calling and what God's preparing you for, but in eternity. The decisions we make today have internal impact on tomorrow, right? So what we've got to do is not listen to the empty words uh, of our friends, maybe, or the people around us or the media that are telling us, go out there, have fun, do what you want, how you want, when you want, why you want. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Forget about it. And we've got to be future-minded and understand that what we do today matters. Amen? Do you guys believe that tonight? Yeah. You know, when we're talking about fog and we're looking at fog specifically, the science of fog, I want to go over that for a second. But what fog, with fog, when the warmer the, uh, the warmer the air is with fog, the more water it can hold, okay? The more moisture it holds. And as the temperature gets cooler, the, the air loses its ability to hold water. And I feel like in the same way, we can be on, a f on fire for God someday. We can be on fire for God. Our temperature is up here. Our spiritual temp temperature is way up here. And, and at some point, we allow empty words to creep in, and our temperature begins to drop, and we lose our capacity to hold the word of God as truth. And the fog sets in, and things that were clear at one point become unclear in that moment. It's because what we allow to enter here. It's because what we allow to enter here, the things that are contradictory to what the Bible says doctrinally, but also who the Bible says you are and your value and everything like that. So it's just something that we have got to be guarded of. I know now, now that we've talked about empty words and what they are, let's talk about what they cause. What do empty words cause? Well, just like fog, empty words cause doubt. They cause you to doubt your surroundings. They cause speculation. And empty words can cause hesitation. You see, just like physical fog, empty words can render you ineffective if you allow them to. They cause you to doubt the people around you. They cause you to doubt what the word of God says about you. They cause you to doubt the plan that God has for you that at one point probably was so clear in your life and because of what you've allowed in is now unclear. Empty words 
cause speculation. They cause you to begin to form theories in your mind about people who you once trusted, beliefs you once held fast to, and a God you once loved. It caused you to hesitate. It caused hesitation. And at one time, you were ready and eager to jump in and follow the will of God in your life. And because of what you've heard and what you've allowed into your heart, now you're not so sure. We've got to stay guarded and mindful when it comes to empty words. You know, my father-in-law is a, a pilot, and he was a, a pilot for Southwest Airlines for over 30 years. And he was a Navy fighter pilot before that, and I love talking about airplanes. I love talking about aviation with him. And, and uh, in one of our recent conversations, I was talking to him, and I asked him the question. I said, you know, Glenn, tell me what you do when, I like to hear all those bad stories. Like, tell me what you do when, you know, you're flying and you're trying to land and you can't see. Things are unclear. Maybe it's stormy. Maybe uh, there's fog and you can't see. And I'll never forget how he responded. He told me, he said, Nick, no matter what's going on in the cockpit, no matter how th clear things are from my perspective, whenever I'm trying to land, I always do two things. And he said that the first thing he does is he trusts his instruments and the second thing he does is he listens to the people on solid ground. He told me that pilots are trained to trust their instruments more than their personal instincts. Because in adverse conditions, pilots become disoriented and can react impulsively. And he told me to tr he trusted the, the people on solid ground because they're the ones giving him direction on where to land, which runway to take, and how to land safely on the ground. And it's the very same thing for us as well. And as we're looking at how we navigate empty words, what we've got to do is when things begin to get disoriented in our lives, we've got to trust our instruments. And how do we do that? By taking everything we hear, everything that we hear on the media, everything we hear in the classrooms, everything we hear in our circles of friends and family, and everything that somebody says to us, how we do that is by taking everything we hear and throwing it up against the word of God and making sure it sticks. If it doesn't stick, it doesn't enter. And that's what we have to remember. You know, in 1 John chapter 1, uh, chapter 4, uh, John says, uh, we must test the spirits to see whether they are from God. And what he's speaking about is testing the spirits of people's intentions when they're speaking in our lives, when they're speaking to us, when they're saying things to us, about us, or around us. We need to make sure that as believers, we are testing what they're saying by throwing it up against the word of God to making sure it's valid and credible so it doesn't enter our spirits and change our perspective. You know, the word of God uh, it should be a compass for us. Not part of the Word of God, not the Word of God or parts of the Word of God we like, but the Word of God in its entirety needs to be a compass for us to stay grounded in truth. Amen? You know, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, tra and training in righteousness. All Scripture, not part of it, all of it. The second thing that we've got to do is listen to the people on solid ground. We've got to listen to the people on solid ground. We need to seek godly counsel. Very simple. You know, like, like, like my father-in-law is looking for direction and guidance when landing an aircraft, listening to the people that he trusts that have a different perspective than, than, than he does. We've got to do the same thing. And we've got to listen to those people who, who are godly in nature, who are grounded in truth, and who are going to guide us in the direction we need to go. But those people that are also going to challenge us and push us to be better, to push us to do better, to push us to do more, and to do different if we need to do different. We've got to surround ourselves with godly people and listen, listen to those people who are on solid ground. You know, there are 25 verses in the Bible related to godly counsel. It's, it's talked about a lot. And they're not even verses, they're passages, they're stories. There's a lot of examples in Scripture where kings and leaders and people throughout, you know, Scripture and the history of the Bible are, are seeking wisdom, seeking godly counsel. And yet, a lot of us in this place today will make si silly decision after silly decision and then wonder why we, our life is so jacked up. And it's because we've never taken the time to ask somebody whose opinion matters about the decisions we're making. And we're listening, we're listening to what the world is saying instead of listening to what the Bible says and holding fast to the truths in here. 
And again, that's what Paul is speaking to in Ephesians 5, 6. He's speaking to all the things we need to do, all the things we don't need to do. And then he says, be careful of the empty words of people who are going to try to knock you off your path, the people that are going to try to take you away from what you know to be true. You know, Psalm chapter 37, uh, verses 30 to 31 in the NLT says, the godly offer good counsel. They teach right from wrong. They have made God's law their own, so they will never slip from his path. So they'll never slip from his path. We can't lose sight of the importance of seeking godly counsel in our life. You know, when it comes to scripture, when it comes to empty words, when it comes to what we're supposed to do, it's not hard, but it's hard for us to grab hold of. And it's an easier said than done thing, right? A lot of times we'll find ourselves in the moment making a silly decision because of the input from somebody who we shouldn't have listened to to begin with. And so what we've got to do is take a step back and begin to use the foundations of truth that are in Scripture to help guide our lives. The foundations of truth that are in the Word of God to help us make better decisions. The foundations of truth right here that will help guide you and keep you safe. We've got to steer clear of empty words, not just doctrinally. We've got to understand that the Word of God in its entirety is for us. And it's designed for us to help us be everything that God has called us to be. You know, when you look at Ephesians 5, 6, we only read the first part of the verse, right? And we're going to put it on the screen behind us. But Ephesians 5, 6 in its entirety says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. God's wrath. God's wrath. The even notion of God's wrath today rubs people the wrong way sometimes. Right? I thought this God was all grace or all love. God's wrath. A lot of people today will say that God's wrath is an archaic concept, that there's no place for it anywhere today. And I'm going to be honest with you, God's grace is real, and God is a God of grace and mercy and love. But the idea of God's wrath being archaic or a thing of yesterday or not being true is false words. God's wrath is very, very real. And the reason God's wrath is real is because God and sin can't exist in the same place. That sound sounds really eerie, doesn't it? Like, God's wrath is real. <laughs> Repent. That's perfect, actually, for that. But see, <laughs> that moment's gone now, Nick. But seriously, no, God's, God's wrath, when we're thinking about it in context, is a real thing. And it's real, and it's evident, and it's there. And it's something that we've got to be aware of. But it's, again, it's because, I have a feeling now, I almost heard it. It's because God can't exist where sin exists, right? We know that, right? God, sin is the antithesis of who God is. There, there is no coexisting with God in sin. And so when we think about God's wrath, now I'm reminded of, bear with me, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, I went to the hospital uh, a few years ago when my grandma was diagnosed with cancer, and um, I got to spend time with her after her diagnosis, and I got to talk to her oncologist, and what I learned from her oncologist, what he told me was he was personally, personally committed to hating the cancer that was in my grandma's body. He hated that cancer. He hated it. And he looked me in the eye and told me, I personally hate this cancer with every fiber of my being. And then what he went on to say is that he said that uh, he was justifiably committed to eradicating every ounce of it that he possibly could. And what's crazy about it, you, you, can just, you can just stop. We're good. We're good. No keys. What's, cra what's crazy about it is... When it, when, it comes to, when it comes to that whole story, like, when you're looking at it, hold on. Whew. So he was justifiably committed to eradicating the cancer from my grandma's body. And I feel in the same way for us 
you know, God is looking down on us and seeing the sin in our life, like the doctor saw that s- the cancer in, in our, my grandma's body. And in the very same way, he hates the sin in our lives. He wants to see us live a life full and healthy away from sin. And it's not that God hates you. It's not that God, God's wrath is on you. It's that God can't exist where sin exists. And if we're existing where sin exists, then God can't exist there. And that's what he's speaking to. And I was reminded of that when I was thinking on my grandma and what that doctor told me. The doctor told me again that he hated the cancer that was in my grandma's body and that he was committed to eradicating every bit of it that he possibly could. And it's the same thing for us when it comes to sin in our life and God. See, the wrath of God is not some childish outburst from an angry father. It's not. It's not a childish outburst. The wrath of God is the justified response of God to everything that he knows is spoiling and destroying our lives. It's the justified response to that. Once, and once we've accepted Christ, and if you're in here and you've made a decision for Christ, once you've accepted, accepted Christ, you know that God's wrath towards sin is not poured out on us. But God's wrath towards sin was poured out on Jesus when he went to the cross to die as us. And that's the promise we have in who Jesus is. That's the promise we have. And that's what we have to hold on to, is that understanding that, yes, God's wrath is real. Yes, it's a real thing, but it's not towards you. It's towards sin. And as long as sin is in your life over here and you're living in sin over here, God can't be there. But he wants to be. He wants to be where you are. He's called you to great things. He, he has great plans for you. But we have to take that step and make sure that we are living the life that we're called to live according to who God is and who God has called us to be.